Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. We're outside the Electroharmonics headquarters here. This is where the factory is, as well as the offices for that classic, iconic music industry company founded back in the late 60s by Mike Matthews. Let's step inside. We're going to take a factory tour, and we're going to talk to Mike Matthews about the company as well. So we are here in the head office with the head honcho himself. This is Mike Matthews. Great to see you. Rock and roll. <laughs> right on. And you've been doing this for a while. Uh, yeah, we, uh, I first started uh, with Electromonics back in October 1968. Wow. So 50 years. Uh, yeah, there was a pause. You know, I was growing super fast. I was very aggressive, uh, uh, doubling sales every year. Started out with a thousand bucks, built it up to five million. Whenever I had a problem, I was able to solve it. Uh, but I stretched my payables late. And any time I had a good idea, I went after it. Finally, I had too many problems at once, and I collapsed uh, and went bankrupt in, in 1984. Right, but then you, you came but back. I started again in, in the late 80s, initially with vacuum tubes, and then um, saw that all the, the pedals, and I, I made hundreds of thousands of pedals in the 70s, they were all selling for much more than they were selling for in the 70s. Uh, this new vintage market developed, and at that time, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed, or everything in Russia was a military factory, and they all were looking for survival for work. I hooked up with a small military factory in St. Petersburg that made test equipment, and just gave them a circuit diagram and a sample of a Big Muff, and they made the very early Russia Big Muffs, the Softec Big Muffs, and, um, but they sounded slightly different from the American one. Some people liked them better. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, now we're making, I think we make more varieties of pedals than any company in, in, in the world. Yeah, it's amazing. We'll take a, a step down into the factory and you were showing us the huge array of, of pedals and things that you make. It is, it is truly astounding. Well, I hate to discontinue a pedal uh, that's good. <laughs> we had the, the LPB-1 has been going since 67, 68, right? We're still selling L LPB-1s. We're still selling, you know, 3,000 big muffs a month. Wow. And um, it just goes on. Well, that's crazy. I remember my very first pedal was a little big muff pie. First uh -huh. pedal I ever bought back in the late 70s. Yeah, well, keep it because we're going to discontinue the little big muff pie. Yeah, well, we have just too many, <laughs> too many <laughs> models. So, Mike, it looks like we are in the area where pedals are assembled. I don't think I've ever seen so many pedals in my life. You guys uh, must be thousands of them here, and, and all these. Uh, there are literally thousands of pedals here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what are we looking at here? Well, this particular pedal is one of our very popular pedals from our nine series, the Mel Nine. That could, you could play guitar and it'll sound just like a melaton, Mellotron. Right. And we, we, we get in our printed circuit boards all assembled mm -hmm. from overseas and just mi screw them into the chassis here. And then later, uh, Rosalina is an expert on this particular pedal. She'll test these. Okay. Everything on the, on the oscilloscope. Okay. Once they're tested on the scope, they get back to sealing where they're sealed, and every single pedal we make is tested on guitar. So we want to make sure that everything is perfect quality. That's, that's, to us, it's better to control your manufacturing in the States here than overseas, where if things get out of control, you don't have perfect QC control with, with the you know, guitar testers that know what they're doing you could end up with a bad batch and it could be disastrous. Right. And over here, Monica is doing the same thing, same exact thing, but she is assembling our new product, which is going to be a monster hit. We haven't shipped any yet. The Grand Canyon, which is a, a successor to a very popular Canyon delay unit. It's awesome, and we just overloaded with orders ready to ship as soon as we fix two very minor software problems. Right, right. I know we're really excited to get those in over Sweetwater. Yeah, you, you, Sweetwater you know, placed a very nice uh, order. Awesome. And we're shipping you guys right at the beginning. Uh, Narcissa is testing on the oscilloscope 
the Grand Canyons that Monica assembled. If uh, making sure that everything is set and uh, later we're going to you know, put in the software, seal them, and test them on guitar. Now, over here, Helen is assembling a very popular soul food. This is our version of the, you know, uh, discontinued Klons, and it's the number one seller of, the, of that type of unit. Very big seller for us, the soul food. So, so where does the idea come from? Where do you, uh, the idea for a new pedal, how does that come about? Well, first of all, right now with the new company, I run it much more like a business. I don't go after every new idea we come up with. And, uh, uh, you know, I keep a, a balance of products we're designing from some simple analog, some simple digital, to maybe one or two complex digital. I like to, I don't like to be involved with a product that we can't release in, in, within a year or else, you know, and I also, once we set the architecture that we want for a digital pedal, for example, we stick with it. Like along the way, a lot of times engineers will say, hey, we should include this or we should include that. Say, no, you know, once you start on a digital product, you, the, the designer spends his first time thinking on the software structure. And if you try to uh, you know, stick in a new feature, it could upset that software structure, leading to bugs and delays on getting out the product. If they have a good new idea, I say, let's leave it for a future model. So that's the way we do products. I mean, years ago, I would decide not only what product we're going after, but every single feature. Now I decide on what product we'll design, but the designers come up with good suggested features themselves, and, uh, and that works out well. Uh, this room is where we design the pedals, although five of our designers work outside of the company. One in the UK, uh, maybe the greatest designer in the world, David Cockrell, one in Connecticut, one in Michigan, and two in California. And these great designers here. Ryan here did the uh, Ocean's Eleven. Nice. Now he's, he's working on a follow-up. The Ocean's Twelve? Well, uh, we, uh, we haven't settled on the name. <laughs> haven't named it yet. Some, some people have suggested that. <laughs> so do the designers specialize in analog and digital, or do they all do everything? Well, they can all do, mostly do everything, but there's different guys with different strengths. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's a complex area. <laughs> sure. You know, and even in, within digital, there's, um, you know, subspecialties. Right, right. But you're actually a, a keyboard player, right? Yeah, a lot of people think I play guitar, but I don't. Now, I used to be a great keyboard ba player back in 1962. Right? Yeah. All right, right. But obviously you have many guitar players here at the, uh, oh, the production. Oh, we so have we... maybe 15 guitar players work in the company. Right, right, right. So once uh, you mentioned that it can take up to a year to to create a product, is that because is that a digital product or is that an analog product? Is there well, a the analog products usually are simpler mm -hmm. uh, and they're much faster. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the thing with the product is we've got to also design the uh, art for the chassis. We got to get in samples of those products. Then frequently the original PC board layout has to be changed. There's an error then every product has to undergo what's called um, different types of safety testing for all the different world markets, especially in Europe. And so it's a, it's a long process. Right, right, yeah, I imagine so, I imagine so. So tell us a little bit about how you, uh, you, you mentioned that you came back into the company by starting with tubes, and of course tubes are still a big part about what you're doing. Tell us a little bit about the tube world at this point in time. The tube world is, is slightly declining. I mean, for us, 85, 90% of the tubes go for guitar amplifiers, maybe 15% for high-end hi-fi amps, which is still prominent, because they, they sound better than solid state, no matter what people tell you, oh, I got my solid state, that, that really gives a tube sound. It's not true. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, Electromonix owns uh, one of only three remaining factories in the whole world that make vacuum tubes. 
And we're uh, prominent, particularly in the replacement market, because we make the highest quality tubes with famous brand names. Over this section here is where we match the tubes. And, uh, and, and these machines uh, spit out the tubes with labels that have matching numbers of both plate current and transconductance. And one here is pairing up ones that match into, into pairs and quads. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So did you go back and find v examples of the vintage tubes as you're recreating those and reissuing those? Well, yes, yes. That, that's exactly what we did. Right, right. So take us back to the, the early days of the company. Were you, I mean, were you doing everything at that point, or did you have people that were doing the production and things for you in, the, in those days and the sales and things? Which company? The first the, one? Or the the very, very original one back in the 60s. Well, the first company... Before I founded Electromonics, I was working for IBM and I wanted to quit and go on the road for a couple of years. I had that bug to be a rock and roll star that everybody, you know, had that itch, wanted to be a big star and jealous of the Beatles and the Stones. Sure. And, um, but I was married at the time. My wife was conservative. So I uh, wanted to make some, a pile of money quick. I, you know, basically, I've always been into business since I was five years old. Grew up in the Bronx, fishing balls out of the sewers and selling them, you know, with the coat hangers. And, you know, when I went to camp and uh, everybody was playing golf, I'd be out in the woods looking for golf balls uh, to sell uh, uh, and on and on and on. Right. So, so at that time, the Rolling Stones had their huge hit, Satisfaction. And everybody wanted a fuzz tone. But the factory that made fuzz tones couldn't make them fast enough. So there was, a, there was this guy on 48th Street. In those days, there were about 20 music stores all on 48th Street. And th this guy was a, a repair guy, Bill Burko, and he was making these fuzz tones one at a time. So he says, Mike, come on in with me and we'll make them much faster. So I said, okay. And he didn't do anything. And I was stuck. So uh, doing it all myself. So I hooked up with a, a place in Long Island City called All Instruments that, uh, that assembled uh, electronics. So I built them. And at that time, I don't, I don't remember how, but Al Drange, the founder of Guild Guitars, uh, found out about it, contacted me and said he wanted to buy all of them. And, that, and then he, by this time, my friend, my buddy Jimi Hendrix was hot. So he decided to call them Foxy Ladies. Okay. So we had these fuzz tones printed up, Foxy Lady. And every two th couple of weeks, I'd pick up a batch, drive out to uh, Hoboken, deliver them to Guild. They'd write me out a check, and then I'd come back to work. All the pedals that are tested on the oscilloscope are brought over here, and then they're sealed. Everybody here on this line, all they do is seal the pedals. And, um, and once they're sealed, they're brought over to the uh, uh, guitar testing room. And every single pedal that we make is not only tested on the scope, but tested by guitar, every single one. And that's why we ship Sweetwater perfect quality Electromonix products. <laughs> And over here, Transito is sealing the Mel 9, our Mellotron uh, simulator, which can make guitars sound exactly like uh, the famous Mellotrons that the Beatles recorded on, and, and a lot of other hits were made on the Mellotron. So, Mike, how many people are working here in the factory? Uh, well, in the whole company, we have 130 here in New York. Okay. And uh, of that, I'd say... Uh, there's about 55 in production. Okay. Maybe 60. I wanted to design a product where everybody could sound like Jimi Hendrix, and his whole thing was that long sustain. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of my buddies at, at, at uh, IBM hooked me up with this brilliant uh, inventor at Bell Labs, Bob Meyer, that had worked for... Bell Labs and had, uh, had uh, uh, over the years, developed 60 pioneer patents from defense systems to uh, 
to, to a, a product that revolutionized the cellular telephone industry. And he agreed to design this distortion-free sustainer. Now, having sustain was not a problem because as the signal would die out, you could just slowly increase the amplitude. The problem was all of a sudden when you play a new note, Bang, this huge volume came through, you get pops, clicks, and how to eliminate those. That was the problem. So anyway, I went out with a guitar, even though I'm not a guitar player, to test a model he had, and plugged in front of it was a little box. I says, Bob, what do you got this box plugged in front of the uh, this sustainer prototype? He says, well, I didn't realize that the guitar put out such a low volume, so I built this booster. So I plugged that in, in turned on the switch, and all of a sudden, the amplifier got much louder. Now, this is in 1968, in uh, mid-1968. And in those days, all the amplifiers were designed with a lot of headroom. You'd turn an amp up to 10, it wouldn't distort. With the LPB-1, you could plug that into an amp, and it would get much louder. But then, as you increase the volume on the LPB-1, all of a sudden, it drove it into overdrive. And that was the first product uh, that really initiated overdrive. And uh, PV, Hartley PV, used to give tours where he would tell the story how he waited in line. In those days, the trade show was in, in, in Chicago in the hotels. And, uh, and I was exhibiting in a hotel room. And people were waiting in line to hear these demos of the LPV-1, Hartley says how he waited on the line, finally got up, bought one, took it back, opened it up, saw it only had one transistor, and he said he implemented that into one of his early amps, and that was his first hit uh, guitar amplifier. How about that? But anyway, and we're still selling LPV-1s today. That's, that's crazy, that's crazy. You've had a number of firsts with oh, the company. Oh yeah, yeah, we were number of firsts. I mean, we were the first company to bring out uh, a commercial uh, a flanger. Before that, the, the flanging technique was by rocking the tapes. And we recognized when the bucket brigades came out that we could uh, do that. And um, our brilliant designer, David Cockerell, who works out of England, came up with the design for the first electric mistress flanger. Right. And then we were first with analog uh, delays, you know, with our first our memory man and then the deluxe memory man as better chips came out well, from uh, Panasonic. Uh, we were the first uh, to develop the looper. We were the, uh, the, the 16 second digital. Uh, so, and now looping is a very big category. And we were the first um, to develop inexpensive uh, samplers with our instant replay. And that, that's in the past. Now, nowadays, we're the first with these nine products where we, nobody's been able to emulate us. With, you know, where we have the B9, C9 organ simulators, the Key9, it's uh, like electric keyboard simulator, the Mel9, Mellotron, and the Synth9, where you can uh, emulate nine different uh, uh, polyphonic uh, uh, synthesizers. Uh, we're first with the POG, and you know, nobody's been able to duplicate that, where we, you can, uh, with polyphonic chords, uh, add uh, octaves up, two octaves up, an octave or two down, uh, with the HOG, uh, have intervals of a thirds and fifths. Lots we're, of great stuff. Yeah, we're still trying, but we still uh, try to, you know, keep bringing out some simple stuff, improve the old stuff. And actually, our hottest seller right now is our Triangle Big Muff, which sounds great. It's my favorite of all the different Big Muff models. Right, right. I was going to ask you, actually, what's your, what's your, uh, so that's your favorite of the Big Muff models. What's your favorite pedal that you've done through all the years? Well, my favorite is what sells. <laughs> it's, it's still a business. And if it sells, it's making money. If it's making money, I can hire more engineers, pay more engine, pay the engineers more, pay everybody more. So that's my favorite is what sells. Right, right. So, so it had to be quite an experience getting the manufacturing going in Russia in those days? Oh, that was simple. Uh, Arusha Bidakova found this small uh, military factory in St. Petersburg, and uh, they, 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 they worked their butts off and, and, and did it, and, and came up, you know, redesigned a big, a big foot switch. It was in a big box, and a lot of people liked that Russian military tank feature. 
earlier, I had lost my trademark electromonics, so earlier we called them Softec. Later on, I got that trademark back. But um, it, it was a good seller. And then after that, we did the, um, I think it was the Small Stone and Baseballs in Russia. Mm -hmm. But since then, we started making them in the USA. Uh, costs in Russia were not stable. So now every, all pedals are made only in New York City. Uh, this whole line here is where we actually uh, put the tested products into, into boxes ready for shipping. And Sylvia over here is sealing up a very popular Ocean's Eleven reverb unit, which I think is the number one seller in reverbs mm -hmm. in the market. And when she's done, then they'll be boxing up these soul foods. What you, what you have up here on these shelves and also two layers well behind it is our inventory of the raw materials, printed circuit boards, chassis, boxes, just for electromonics pedals. On these shelves here is all products that have been tested by guitar waiting to be boxed when we need them boxed. Okay, that was all One more thing. Yeah. Rock and roll. <laughs> and we dig sweet water. I hope you've enjoyed this look inside Electro Harmonics. What an amazing company. Incredible array of pedals. Such a history going all the way back to the 60s. So much great stuff. We're coming to you from the roof of the Electro Harmonics building. The uh, Manhattan skyline is here behind me. And I appreciate you joining me here in New York. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater.